Now, lately I've been thinking about what it would have been like working as a data analyst in the United States. For those who don't know, I'm currently working as a data analyst in the UK right now. The other day I remembered I had an offer to work for a finance company in Grand Rapids, Michigan in the United States. And I realized that I never really thought about why I'd turn the offer down. So as much for the viewers as for myself, today we're gonna to compare and contrast the differences between working as a data analyst in the UK versus working as a data analyst in the US. And we'll see which one comes out on top. Now, obviously the first thing we have to cover is salary. That's definitely what everybody wants to know. The United States has higher base salaries for almost all jobs and that stands true for data analysts as well. On average the salary for a data analyst in the United States is $90,000 which obviously varies depending on location and company but the average is $90,000. That translates to a GBP value of £70,700. In comparison the average base salary for a UK data analyst is £45,000, which translates to a USD value of $57,300. Now, obviously, these figures are relative to currency exchange rates, but that's still a pretty severe difference. And I think there's a few reasons for that. One being that the cost of living in the United States, particularly in major tech and finance hubs like Silicon Valley or New York City, is generally higher than in many, many parts of the UK. So to try and account for that, you get higher salaries. Now, that doesn't apply to London. London is pretty comparable to cities like New York and San Francisco in terms of cost of living. In some senses, it's even more expensive to live in. They all share astronomical costs of living slash surviving. I would also argue that there's greater market demand in the US for skilled technical professionals simply because the economy is larger and more diverse. There are more companies so there's more competition and thus higher salaries. Now as with everything generalization, the generalization that we're making here doesn't capture the complexity of every individual case but as a barometer for comparison the factors we've covered are a pretty good indication of why the US has higher salaries than UK. So objectively salary goes to the US. That's one nil to the United States. Moving on to career progression. Now, career progression is largely dependent on the individual, but I, th I think that the US has more opportunities for lateral career progression than the UK does. That's not to say that the UK doesn't, but if we look at it from a purely business standpoint, the US wins out by miles. People in the US are far more open to innovation, new ideas and technology, and that openness to new ideas and technology coupled with lower taxes comes venture capital and investment into startup companies. If you were to start a company, raising money in the UK is much, much harder than it is in the US. In 2021, there were 5.4 million startups created in the US. In comparison, in the same year, there were only 800,000 in here in the UK. Startups always, always, always need technical people. And if you were able to get into a startup in its early stages, then your career progression to CTO, CFO, or a senior member in the team can be very, very, very rapid. As a data analyst, you might also be much happier at a company in the US because the guide rails are lower, there's less regulation and more room for you to experiment and be creative with. The US also has a far more complete set of uh, stages for funding for new companies. They're actually set out stages for raising finance for a new company, series A, B, and C funding stages. And again, with the domino effect, the more complete funding process means that companies can pay their employees more. While here in the UK, you may be able to get early stage funding, but then late stage funding becomes increasingly more difficult to procure. You have to jump through so, so many hoops here in the UK and your network becomes a much more important factor in obtaining late stage funding for a company. I can personally attest to that. Also here in the UK, I think you're all slightly confined to London if you want stratospheric levels of career progression. Unless you're able to get into a really, really good company with decent pay and stock options in Manchester, Birmingham or elsewhere, London is the only place you can really, really hope to climb the corporate ladder. As a data analyst, if you're working in Silicon Valley, then you'll be working with the absolute cutting edge of technology and innovation, which is why partners at tech giants in Silicon Valley are so, so highly sought after. The UK in comparison doesn't really innovate at all anymore. And in 2021, Cambridge University filed an innovation report stating that the UK has a private sector funding problem. Again, less people are open to innovation, less people are open to the idea of new companies and startups and really bolstering the tech sector within the UK. Best blend of both economies would be to work at a company that's either based in the UK or the US, depending on which cultures you prefer, but allows for a lot of international travel 
between offices between the two countries. Unfortunately for analysts, that opportunity for travel often comes later on in life as you progress to being a manager or a consultant. So that's sort of a catch 22. I'm going to have to give this section to the US as well. And it's 2-0 going into half time. Employee entitlements, spoiler alert, maybe the UK claws back a point after this section. Let's break down healthcare. Now, as you probably know, the US has an insurance-based healthcare system provided by private sector companies. Whereas here in the UK, there's the National Health Service, which is a publicly funded healthcare system. Now we could go into an entire rabbit hole about which system is better, but from an objective standpoint, the UK system is much more simple. In the US, while employer-sponsored health insurance is common. There are complex insurance policies, you have to navigate insurance contracts, insurance contracts that can differ between companies and just in a general sense the system is the system is much more a case-by-case -case basis. For data analysts, as skilled technical professionals, it's likely that almost all companies within the US will provide you with healthcare insurance, which on all levels should be fairly comprehensive. It should cover a lot. Large companies tend to have programs in place for employee healthcare policies that kick in once you start to onboard. The main thing to consider is that in the the US, if you lose your job, you also lose your employer-sponsored health insurance, and then you would have to enroll into a private plan. There are extended or alternative policies and plans that you can consider, but that just ends up being another thing you have to bear in mind alongside you having lost your job. Employees in the UK are entitled to a minimum number of days off in a year, while legally US workers aren't entitled to paid holiday off at all, even though most companies do offer paid vacation time. However, there isn't a set minimum and on average the US worker receives 10 days of paid vacation time in a year in comparison to 28 days for UK workers. Now that's a pretty important difference to bear in mind. Leading on from paid vacation time, the UK tends to stick to an the regiment of 40 hour work weeks. While from my research and talking to other analysts who work in US based firms, the US tends to be a lot more flexible with the extension of your hours, especially within the tech and finance industries. My colleagues in the American market say that the trend or culture leans towards longer working hours. Now, even for me in the UK, I do always say that if you sign up for a job in finance or tech, you should expect to be working longer than the 40 hours allotted for you in the week. When I'm working with a client, when I'm working on a large project, work-life balance does get kicked out of equilibrium. But in general, the UK does seem to be better at following a standardized work week model. So this section goes to the UK. The largest change that has happened in the UK economy recently has been Brexit, which is Britain leaving the European Union. And I've been able to see some of the changes or maybe even you could call them repercussions. I've been able to see them firsthand. It's become more difficult to obtain financials and information on companies that are registered in the European Union or in Europe. There are more regulatory considerations and just less market access than there was before. That isn't to say that London isn't still a key player in the financial markets. It houses the Bank of England, the LSE remains the world's most international stock exchange, and as of September 2023, London's financial centre lags behind. Only New York coming in second in the GFCI, the Global Financial Centre's index ranking. However, interestingly, in the top 10, the US holds five positions on the GFCI ranking. So 50% of the world's largest financial centres, the US holds in the top 10, with New York leading the pack. In comparison, the UK has only the one in the top 10. London. Additionally, the list ranks New York as number one with a rating of 763, London at number two with 744, and Singapore at number three with a ranking of 742. Now that's a drop of 19 points, approximately 2.5% from New York to London, and only a two point drop, not point 27% from London to Singapore. Now that's interesting because that means that New York is quite a bit ahead of the remainder of the pack. If you take a look at the sub ranking for the main areas of financial services, New York remains at the top for all sectors, with London occupying most of the number two spots, save for banking, professional services and trading, with those being held by Shenzhen and Singapore respectively. The UK's currency, the Great British Pound, remains a stronger currency than the dollar, although the exchange rate has fallen over the last 15 years. The United States also does have the world's largest economy and it's been an established powerhouse in international trades for years and years. And the, the United States dollar remains the globally most traded currency with an average daily trade volume of 2.9 
trillion dollars. That also means that the dollar is the default global currency. After seeing all that, it would be really hard to argue against the US being a bigger and arguably better economy, but the UK is fighting back. They've introduced programs to fund investment into artificial intelligence, and they aim to become a quote unquote artificial intelligence superpower, although but these developments are mainly concentrated in London. And even with all the programs and investment into all these innovations, it'll be tough going up against the entire US on all these economic innovations. This round once again goes to the United States. Study opportunities. Now let's take a look at studying both in the UK and the US. This section is a little more difficult to find a straight cut divide between the two. Both countries have world-class leading institutions in tech and finance. The UK has Imperial College, University College London, the London School of Economics, the Oxford Universities of course, and more. The US has Wharton, Stanford, MIT, UPenn, Harvard, and more. Between the two, there are equally good courses and opportunities for study study for data analysts in both the tech and finance industries. In the whole study opportunity section, one thing you do have to consider is student loans and debt. Tuition fees in the US, on average for both domestic and international students, is a little bit higher. They're dependent on the institution and can range anywhere from $25,000 per year to $40,000 per year. But they can rise to $50,000 a year and more if you choose a private or prestigious university. Now, in all honesty, the UK isn't much better for international students. Leading universities also charge enormous sums of money. As an example, Cambridge University charges £64,000 a year for international medical students. I don't understand how you can go for domestic students, 9250 350 whatever it is, to £64,000 a year. But UK student loans are essentially a type of graduate tax where you pay back 9%, I think it's 9% of anything you earn over a certain threshold. And currently the law or legislation is that if it isn't paid off in a certain amount of time, the whole thing gets written off. US student loans are much more in line with normal debt and your repayments depend on the amount you owe or the amount of your debt. It doesn't take into account your income or ability to pay. From my understanding, even if you go bankrupt, you still have the debt. Now, what I can say from personal experience is that good universities in London have great connections to the finance sector in Canary Wharf. And I'm sure the same is true for the US. I'm sure leading universities have great connections to the financial hubs. For example, the University of, is it West Virginia? I need to check. It's the University of Virginia, the School of Law. As an adjunct professor, they have Jim Donovan, who's the vice chairman of global client coverage at Goldman Sachs, the investment banking division. And he comes and gives lectures on how to become an investment banker, how to work on deals, how to progress within the industry, which is exactly what you should look for in an institution. So the US has that as well. My university did a lot similar. A lot of guest professors were brought in who were investment bankers. We held round tables with investment bankers, software programmers, consultants, and many, many other finance and tech professionals who were working in the city, which proved very, very helpful in getting the right career direction and advice. I'm gonna have to call this one a draw. There are both really comparable institutions and study opportunities for data analysts in both the UK and the US. So we've come to an objective outcome. I mean, the US clearly won over the UK. The United States took three out of the five categories. So I guess I'm moving to the United States of America. Large portion sizes, large portion, por large portion sizes. Now I have to learn all of the, uh, all of the lingo. Soda, can't say petrol. I have to say gas. What else? I have to drive on the other side of the road. Oh my God. In reality, it's a little more complicated than that. In large part, the factors we've covered depend on individual circumstance, individual preference, individual circumstance, and an individual's priorities. It's entirely up to you. I think I decided to stay in the UK because it was a quicker route to get to where I wanted to be. I was already acclimated to the culture. I knew people who worked in the industry. And ultimately, it was an easier transition than having to move abroad. We'll see where the future takes us, but in terms of UK versus US data analysts, let me know what you think down in the comments. That's all, check out some of my other videos if that's something you're interested in. Thanks for watching everyone and I will see you guys in the next one.